And the United Nations, as we said at the time, was built on a principle. Yes, we cooperate out of need, but there is also a human need to cooperate. Um, you know, what I think about the UN was set up uh, with three goals in mind. First, peace, second, anti-poverty, um, and third, human rights. And that was in the ashes of the Holocaust. They recognized that it cannot be assumed that governments will protect their own people. So it's very hard for the UN, which is a US-led construction, to operate when the US absolutely attacks the UN uh, daily. The third day of a three-day conference on sharing our future together in honor of the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Uh, a body that was created to answer to the catastrophes of its time that has grown and developed over the decades, uh, seeing any number of new challenges, new catastrophes, has had signal successes and also some remarkable failures uh, in its manner of operating. Uh, we are coming here uh, together in this virtual conference uh, at a time which in the Northern Hemisphere is the summer solstice in which in my country, Latvia, was just celebrated uh, with a great deal of joy, even if isolated in family units, having each their own uh, bonfire in honor of the victory of the sun over darkness. Uh, at the same time, our colleagues in the Southern Hemisphere are in the middle of winter and they're having the winter solstice. Uh, we also must remember that our planet is a round one and it keeps turning on its axis. These are entirely arbitrary uh, designations because depending on where you move around on our planet, uh, your east and west will be to your right or to your left. As a convention, it means nothing. I think this emphasizes that even as, as physically and geologically uh, and astronomically, uh, we are part of a cyclical world that is constantly changing, so that our human institutions actually are submitted to various changes as the years go along. Back when Kofi Annan was uh, General Secretary of the United Nations, uh, he invited me to be one of the ambassadors for the reform of the United Nations. And I had a really close look at how it functions and also at the extraordinary resistance to change uh, that such a large body can develop. This does not mean that it cannot change. This does not mean that it cannot adopt. And during the last three years, including today, we have had uh, panels of extraordinarily experienced and distinguished people addressing various issues. And uh, we will have brief reports from them today. Uh, no more than five minutes, if you would, please. And uh, we will go panel by panel as they happened chronologically. Uh, the first panel uh, started in June 23rd at, in the afternoon. It was about the political front and uh, Dr. Noeline Heiser will be uh, reporting on it. Uh, dear Noeline, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam President. I'm actually in Singapore and uh, oh. the... <laughs> Better still. <laughs> yes, and uh, the first panel uh, is actually on the social front, uh, Better Societies for Tomorrow, focusing on health, education, freedom, participation, and reducing inequalities. This panel was moderated by Helen Clark, and members of the panel consisted of uh, Taja Halunin, uh, uh, Tiffy Livni, uh, Kafarida uh, 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 Alahi, Mohammed Yunos, uh, uh, Maitin uh, Aditi, David Penn, and of course myself. I must say that it was a very rich and frank discussion. 
Uh, and uh, let me give you a short summary. Now, during the last, uh, the past 75 years, the, the UN has worked across social and economic development and human rights. And it has set bold agendas for sustainable development. It has championed uh, human development and human rights for all. And it has provided a platform for negotiating conventions which have advanced the rights of women, children, people with disabilities, and refugees. And of course, at the core of these agendas are the building blocks for a better society, health, education, freedom, participation, and reducing inequalities. And over the last 75 years, we have indeed made great strides in reducing poverty, uh, in creating a global middle class, and many lives have been transformed and many uh, achieve, um, important milestones have been achieved through international cooperation. And I don't want us to forget that. However, wealth, power and privilege have been concentrated and far too many people have been left behind. And COVID-19 has magnified the inequalities, the vulnerabilities and the humanitarian challenges we face. People are falling into extreme poverty, joblessness, hunger, desperation on an unprecedented scale. And the development gains that we have worked so hard to gain are being lost. The sustainable development agenda is being pushed back. Informal sector workers, the self-employed, low-wage migrants, especially the undocumented migrants, are the worst affected. And women form a huge per uh, percentage of those who are affected. Yet they are also the largest number of people who are the frontline workers and the caregivers during this pandemic. So just when international cooperation is most needed to address these global threats, the United Nations, our multilateral system and the world order created by shared values and shared responsibilities have been weakened by big power rivalry, by a leadership vacuum and by institutional bottlenecks that Mr. Uh, Madam President, you have referred to in the system. People, especially youth, are angry by the inability of established leaders vested interests and institutions to address these global threats to our well-being and to our existence. People, especially our young people, have started social movements. They have protested and have started new conversations on the type of future we want and the UN that we need. So how do we as adults and leaders accelerate change to create better societies, not tomorrow as suggested by the panels, but we stress by today. So uh, we came up with a five action points, uh, which I would like to go through. One is to rebuild trust in all our countries and regions, fix our broken systems and our leadership, strengthen accountability. We need to rebuild a new social contract, a social protection floor of fundamental rights to unlock the agency and potential of everyone. And with the pandemic, a vaccine must be a global public good, a people's vaccine. Second, we need to value education and dialogue on the culture and understanding, starting with young children and within our own families and communities. Third, we have to accelerate women's participation and leadership as keys to unlock the doors to a better, more inclusive and sustainable future. And fourth, we need to reclaim the convening power and authority of the United Nations so that it is not captured by big power rivalry and weakened by ethno-nationalism. We need to go beyond member states to include we, the peoples, building a more people-centered multilateralism for global problem solving. In fact, we were, we were so frank that we even said stop organizing endless meetings, creating words and agendas that are not implemented, nor taken seriously by leaders. Be more daring. More important than ever, those who share the same values and support multilateralism must come together across borders, sectors and generations to adopt a bold, renewed vision for collective global action, to respond to the, uh, to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, to climate change, extreme poverty, and the concentration of wealth, armed conflicts and displacement, technological disruptions, and other global challenges of the 21st century. 
We need to invest in the power of partnership, harness new alliances of people and resources so that we can build and implement the ethics, the values and agendas for a more inclusive and sustainable future to create a global community that cares. And in closing, I just want to thank you, uh, Madam President, and the co-chairs, and Mariana for really bringing us together on this 75th anniversary of the United Nations to reflect on such important issues. So thank you, everyone. Huh? Hello? Myself. Am I on? Am I on? Oh, yes, yes. yes? Thank you, Dr. Heiser. You're... Uh, distinguished career uh, and your years of experience as Under Secretary General of the United Nations from 2007 to 15 uh, have uh, 2015 have, have given you a, a point of view uh, which is reflected in this, remarkable, in this remarkable summary about the new social contract that is needed worldwide. Uh, hopefully the United Nations will be the one to provide it but one way or another uh, this is something that clearly uh, inhabitants of various parts of our planet have been calling for uh, in a variety of ways. Thank you so much for your participation. We appreciate it greatly. Our next speaker will be uh, my colleague, Dr. Ismail Seregeldin, a co-chair of the Nizami Ganjavi International Center, who also has uh, extraordinary experience uh, in his distinguished career. I note the years as Vice President of the World Bank between 1992 and 2000, in which he uh, became familiar with all the in and outs of, of the financial world, which as we all know since 2008, uh, is not exactly in tip-top order and where a great deal uh, could be improved in the future. Uh, many of us know him also as the founding director uh, and for a long time the builder up, if you like, of the new Library of Alexandria, which not only lives up to the name of its illustrious historical predecessor, but by, I think, by far has surpassed it. And he's been a wonderful colleague. And, uh, and Dr. Ismail, your panel, uh, the second panel on June 23rd, was talking about the political front beyond uh, globalization. The floor is yours. Thank you, uh, uh, President Vaira, and um, thank you all colleagues uh, for having uh, uh, participated in this. It's been a very rich panel. Uh, we took on really two sides together, the politics and the economics, uh, to the extent that you really cannot dissociate them. And we observed several things. Uh, the first one is, yes, the original uh, uh, foundation of the uh, United Nations 75 years ago was accompanied by a parallel structure known as the Bretton Woods structure, which involved the World Bank and uh, what was to become the WTO, but initially was called the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the GATT, uh, to control world trade. And uh, these institutions uh, begat other institutions as well. But fundamentally, there was a, a substantial success in a number of things, including uh, global trade. We went through the Kennedy round, the Uruguay round, and the incomplete Doha round. But effectively, there's been a huge increase in global trade, reduction of tariffs, opening up of economies. But, but that was accompanied by a, a, a huge expansion of inequality within countries and between countries. And this inequality uh, has resulted in tensions in uh, various parts of society and uh, a, a false, uh, or what we think is a, is a, is a, is a false commitment to the idea that private sector will do everything, the idolization of the private sector, to the point where in some leading politicians in the United States in the 80s and 90s used to say government is the enemy. It's not the enemy, government uh, is needed, regulations are needed, 
environmental regulations are needed, health regulations are needed, a lot of other regulations are needed. We need the balance between the two. Simultaneously, a very rapid development took place inside the, 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 the uh, uh, Bretton Woods institutions, which were able to adjust to new realities. So Japan and Germany that started in 1946 as uh, uh, borrowing countries, uh, very uh, poor countries, they grew and took their position. UK, which was number five, uh, number two, went down to number five. The ability to reflect on the enormous rise of China uh, has been handled. But when you come to the UN, on the political structure that was frozen in place in the Security Council, whereby the five victors of the Second World War have permanent seats and have the right of veto, it has been totally impossible to bring any significant change on the political front. So these tensions resulted in part, people said, well, that's because of the Cold War and not the Cold War. But even after 89 to 91, the transition and the collapse of the Soviet Union, the ability to change the political structure of the UN to reflect the realities that, for example, a country like India, which now approaches the population of China, cannot be treated with a single vote the same way that a country like Liberia that has only 5 million inhabitants. So almost 1,300 million inhabitants cannot have really the same weight as uh, 5 million inhabitants. The formula works well in one level, but then we need to find a different way in which we can have decision-making that is then implemented. Why do I say this? Because at least if you look back at the Bretton Woods system, uh, it's been accused of many things and many of them are correct, but at least it has three things that, that uh, the UN system needs to acquire in terms of being able to handle. One is the ability to change, to reflect changing conditions. So the, as the various countries uh, change their, their power, and, and, and we are talking about economic power, we were able in the, in the Bretton Woods system to do that. The second thing is that the, we actually have had in the boards of the IMF, the World Bank, and others, the, the countries that were fighting a hot war with each other sit and vote development money to each other. Now this is, if you reflect on that for a moment, that is an enormous success for part of our international multilateral system. And I'm talking about Arabs and Israelis, I'm talking about Indians and Pakistanis, I'm talking about British and Argentinians over the Falklands. During all these times when there was hot wars going on outside, the representatives could come together in the Bretton Woods institutions and vote development project money to each other for education, for roads, for agriculture, for uh, uh, health, etc. And last, and that is very important, especially given Nolene's uh, uh, observation, is that when a decision is made, it's immediately implemented. Money flows. Vote is today, tomorrow the money uh, goes to the country in question. So that ability, the, we, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. We need to recognize that the UN system at 75 requires amendments and changes, and so does the, the Bretton Woods, which is the economic part of it. So the political and the economic part both need to be changed, but we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We want to take the most effective parts of every experience and bring them together. And one of the most important parts that was done, really, we have to go back, was you know, not only the specialized agencies of the UN, but the enormous effort that was made to bring people together through a remarkable series of summits. Uh, yeah, there were summits before, like the 1972 Environmental Development Summit, but it was really from Rio, the Earth Summit, 1992, that we start seeing this. And then there is the Social Development Summit in Copenhagen. Then there is the Beijing Platform for uh, Empowerment of Women. There is the Population Summit in, in Cairo. 
and the food summit in Rome and so on. And what was remarkable about these is that these was for the first time, the UN embraced, yes, the na nation states, which are the building blocks of the international system, but also the civil society and the NGOs. And that ability to bring both sides together uh, was, I think, a remarkable innovation in the 1990s, and it laid the groundwork to allow the Millennium Development Goals in 2000 to be unanimously adopted, and then Sustainable Development Goals, much broader, much more thoughtful, to be adopted at that time. Regretfully, regretfully, we have had, yes, you pointed out, Madam President, to the 2008 meltdown, uh, that happened because of lack of regulation and a lot of other things, which we uh, technical issues there. But uh, we have had also a, a significant, significant expansion of inequality in practically every country, within every country. And were it not, and here I must salute Dr. Shao and China, were it not for the enormous success of China in raising people above the poverty level, the global figures would have been very different. It was that uh, unprecedented 700 million people who were moved up uh, beyond the poverty uh, level in China that uh, allowed the overall picture to look better. But within countries and even between countries, we have had some significant reduction uh, uh, or some significant increase uh, in inequalities. And these inequalities, uh, led to the generation of uh, nationalistic populist politicians uh, wanting to attack the multilateral system rather than defend it and improve it to attack it. And so we confronted today with the, the coronavirus pandemic and the COVID-19, which in turn have raised very profound issues. When a country like the United States uh, or the European Union can afford to put out stimulus packages in the trillions of dollars, trillions of dollars, not billions, trillions of dollars. And because they, they use their own currencies, the euro or the, or the dollar, and maybe Japan, others can do that. But a lot of the poorest countries in the world cannot do that, cannot afford that. And in fact, with Gordon Brown, we were discussing that it is unthinkable that as this is going on, we're expecting Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, to pay 44 billion in debt repayment and saying we're going to delay it by six months is nowhere near enough to cope with what we need to do. So the challenge is there. The challenge before us that the COVID-19 has brought about with this cascading series of uh, economic and uh, financial consequences. It will put enormous pressure on the developing world, both in terms of uh, the national budgets, the debt, and inflation of their, uh, of their own currencies. I think all of that is, is part of that. So how are we going to be able to have a political decision-making and an economic decision-making on a scale and magnitude that is required to do this, and at the same time, recognize the need for collaboration for a people's vaccine, but beyond the people's vaccine, also to maintain global trade. That is the challenge that we think the political and the economic have to come together for the well-being of people and not for the relative power of individual people or states. Thank you, Dr. Sarah Gildin, and thank you, for summarizing a panel that brought out the crucial link that exists between po politics and economy. We really have to think of them as, as two sides of the same coin because politics are, are just so closely linked together with economy that they, it's, uh, it's an odd, almost an, a matter of just choosing which point of view to emphasize and you have masterfully brought the two together. Our next speaker is going to be Ms. Eka Keshelashvili. She's a former Deputy Prime Minister and uh, Foreign Minister of uh, Georgia. And uh, 
trusted <coughs> and active friend of the Nizami Gamjavi International Center. A very valuable uh, participant in all our events and all our activities. And she has the task of reporting on a third panel of uh, this conference. That's the one uh, that took place on June 24th. And it was on global governments and the rule of law. Eka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Madam President. Um, the, the title of the panel was very interesting to me right away, which speaks for itself in many ways. It's shared future, shared responsibility. And that was the spirit of the panel discussion in so many ways. We've been fortunate to have uh, an excellent uh, uh, array of speakers uh, for the panel discussion, which uh, were coming from a very different uh, um, uh, regions, uh, different experiences, and uh, enabled us to tap into a diversity of the perspectives that could have been brought to the table during discussion. I think one striking um, uh, takeaway, uh, which I had myself on the panel discussion, was that uh, we are indeed at a juncture, at a crossroad uh, into the transition of what will be the new normal for uh, all of us globally. Uh, what that new normal will be, it's not that clear. <clears throat> but what is clear uh, so far is that there is lack of clarity of whether or not there is sufficient degree of leadership from the uh, major actors globally that could bring together global action at the level that would enable at the geopolitical level, if we would uh, summarize in that way, to make the transition already orderly at this moment of time where we are now. So the conclusion uh, that the panel had in that regard, if one could summarize different uh, contributions of the speakers, was that it is undoubtedly clear that for us to be able to tackle demands of the future, to maintain peace, stability, and prosperity in an inclusive way for, for the human race on this planet, it is impossible without cooperation at the global level. It is impossible without reaffirming the values that we are underpinning for so many years, for decades, for the global order as we knew it up until now. But um, at the same time, it, it is clear that it's not the moment in which one could only save what it was, but rather to think of what it could be as the new normal, as the new global order that could serve demands of the future. And in that new normal, it, it is quite clear that the action is required from all angles, meaning from different uh, actors, not only states as the sovereign nations, but quite a bit of emphasis was made on the activity of the civil society, uh, cohesion at the societal level that is needed for that new normal in the future and for the business actors as well to be part of the common action. While we are still at the awaiting moment, perhaps to see when uh, a consolidated action of international actors could be put at place for reinventing, so to say, the global institutions that could be well resourced and apt and institutionally capable to deal with the diverse challenges of tomorrow, we need to take action already now and then partially that was a realization as well that was made that organizations like Nizami Center as well is a good example of that, that every voice matters and we all do have responsibility for that shared future to make contribution now for the future to be better. And one of the key messages that came out of the panel discussion is that this fear factor that so many of us globally do have now because of uh, the magnitude of the pandemic, which amplified, perhaps magnified and accelerated uh, all of those fear factors that otherwise we all had as well, perhaps in different parts of the world, is that it needs to be turned into the hope and into the hope of the common action and into the hope of common action, both at the national levels, at the regional level and at global level as well. One important issue that uh, was uh, clear from the panel discussion was that it would be unrealistic to expect effective global action without seeing through how reforms and transitions at the national level need to take place in such a way that 
social contract, so to say, is revalidated in our societies. We see now what is happening in many European countries. A even striking example is obviously more now these days the United States, which clearly put on surface already the problems related with inclusiveness, inclusiveness at the level of political inclusiveness, at the level of economic inclusiveness, inequalities, and whether or not the validity and legitimacy of the social contract serves or not at this moment as the basis, as a social contract between the citizens and then the state. And it's quite clear that it needs to be reinvigorated. There are new ways that needs to be found for that to become more functional so that inclusiveness is an underpinning foundation of all of that. And for that to work, collective action is needed uh, again for many actors so that ultimately citizens do feel that economy works for them, state works for them, and society has a sense of cohesion rather than polarized divisiveness that is becoming uh, so clear now, not only in the United States, but a bit of a trend in many other developed countries, not only in the development, in the countries in the development phases in that regard. So vulnerabilities at home have been quite clearly identified as one of the big problems that are leading to um, tensions and confrontations internationally. Uh, early stages of the development of the pandemic were cited as an example of natural instinct and at many levels in many societies of turning inwards so that the fear factor became prevailing in, in even in European context at that level as well when pandemic hit. And the natural instinct of closing uh, borders became prevalent at the time rather than search for collective action for finding solutions. Situation is changing now, but one of the conclusions that have been reached by the panel discussion was that the biggest test perhaps now in the short-term perspective, and hopefully it will be in the short-term perspective, will be how much vaccine and then development of the treatments for the pandemic will be seen as part of a global community, commodity, rather than something that will be part of competitiveness among the nations who will have a privileged early access in which nations, in which continents, to the treatment as the better treatments and then to the vaccines as well. And that will be a very vivid example of whether or not, as the human race, we are able to come together uh, in the face of that challenge, rather than uh, we, we are fragmented in the way that divisiveness is becoming more vivid um, reality rather than common action. Uh, quite clearly, criticism was uh, raised uh, with the way how uh, we are able to cope with violence, conflict, and wars at the time of pandemic, even more so. I have cited myself as a moderator, uh, disappointment with the fact that the Security Council was not able to uh, act on a very timely appeal of the Secretary General for at least a ceasefire uh, for the duration of at least 90 days at the, uh, the, uh, mid the midst of pandemic so that at least humanitarian action would have been more of a possibility in so many nations that are hit by the conflict. But we've seen that it was impossible at the local level to hold the ceasefire at many places around the globe uh, where conflicts are still very active. And then at the international level, the action was very mediocre, to say the least, as well. So are we at the stage when institutions as they are, are broken already for them not to be able to function? Or still there is a chance for them to be transformed into the well-functioning institutions with reform and transition that they need to undergo? Part of the problem for that transformation that was cited was that unlike to the times when Bretton Woods institutions were created and then this whole common purpose was the foundation at so many ways of that contract at the level of international relations, so to say, was the existence of the convening power, which was the United States in many ways, and then this vivid understanding of the need of recovery after the world, Second World War. There is lack of that now when it comes to whether or not there is that action that could be expected from uh, either United Nations, States or, or collectively from the major actors. So that remains to be a problem rather than something that could be more of an encouraging factor. And finally, what I would wanted to raise is related with the economy. Uh, it has been already mentioned at today's discussion already between us that inequalities could be, become even higher because 
of the ways how the recovery uh, packages are a possibility for those who have more liquidity funds, like in the EU and then in the US and some other nations in that regard, with their national currencies or economic might for that matter. But then it's the ability to digitalize quicker than others as well, because we already seen that COVID-19 amplified and accelerated this whole process of digitalization of our economies as well. Some countries, some regions will be better placed to do that quicker, to do that more comprehensively, and some nations won't have that opportunity. And if that will be the reality, we'll see perhaps more division in terms of capabilities, economic uh, development, growth of economies, and then with that, the inequalities that could become higher. And field of education is a vivid example linked to that as well. We already have seen that in 2020, it's, it's, it's unfortunately a very large portion of our younger generation, kids at schools that were deprived uh, of any proper means of education, even more so they could have been previously because of a very limited if, uh, access to the internet, to electronic ways of education, to equipment that is needed for that as well. And if that continues to be the case, even more so in the future, we will see that there will be parts of our younger generation that will simply lag behind and will have not even the degree of education that was needed and continues to be needed for the economies of today, but even more so for the economies of tomorrow. So education, access to the education, and education from uh, the point of view of educating our younger generation as citizens of tomorrow is something that was highly stressed during the panel discussion. We've mentioned that, and it was again in line with the title of the panel discussion, I would say that our future is not a future as to which we are entitled to, but rather it's a shared responsibility for all of us as well. And it means that this whole understanding of the values that comes to it and then values of citizenry as well as a way of holding responsibilities towards each other, towards the society and then the state is something that we might need to re-emphasize once again, rather than only talking from the point of view of rights, but rather from the point of view of responsibilities towards our communities as well. And when it comes to the conflicts, final word, we emphasize once again that ceasefire is only a temporary commodity as a beneficial commodity, obviously, if it's achievable, because the lack of violence is not yet a peace. So in many parts of the societies and then uh, globally, we see that even ceasefire uh, is an unattainable goal so far, unfortunately, but even more so last peace and lasting peace once again will be very hard to be expected without social economic development inclusiveness of the societies by that decreasing the level of confrontation at uh, at sectarian level as well in many societies and bringing together collective action at diplomatic level as well by major actors so that the common goal becomes achievement of that better future rather than confrontation and defense of the national interest only. I would conclude at that not to take too much time uh, as an introduction of our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eka, uh, for this clear summary of a very complex discussion on a complex topic. We at the NGIC have joined our voice to a variety of international initiatives that have been lately taken in connection with the pandemic, and one of them has been the need for the accessibility to a universal vaccine. That has been one of the questions. I myself, in a purely personal capacity, I'm currently sitting uh, on, on a high level group of UNESCO on the futures of education. And we know that 1.8 billion children are currently without access to education because of these special circumstances. Not that they're not uh, uh, having difficulties even outside of the pandemic. The pandemic is making it worse. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent summary. And we move on to a report on our fourth panel. His Excellency Zlatko Lagomjia is a former prime minister of Bosnia and Herzegovina. He is a pillar of the NGIC, a very active and very valued participant in all our events and in all our discussions. And the topic of this fourth panel was about the economic front, uh, the moving towards sustainability. And I now give the floor to my colleague Zlatko to report on his fourth panel. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for everyone that is here appearing on the screen. We are so far away from each other because we keep uh, distance, physical distance, but I have a feeling that we haven't been so close uh, as for so many, for so long time. So I really do feel that these three, four days, we created a lot of positive energy and a lot of connectivities among us. This leads me to the, one of the conclusions from our panel, the two key words of economy of the future and the jobs of the future are encapsulated in the word digitalization, one thing, and we are going digital. And second word is uh, being human, being human, being socially together, sharing, sharing our experiences, sharing our lives. And uh, basically speaking, the golden word share, uh, just like the title of our, our overall conference is. But we added today that we think that uh, what we need is more shared issues, more shared leadership, more shared uh, vision, more shared societies in which people feel uh, like they're at home with all their differences. And of course, with shared economy and shared development and understanding that environment is our shared environment. So those are some of the conclusions that we had in our panel. Uh, we had extraordinary eight speakers, and uh, I cannot, uh, I'm very happy that I heard from the previous panels that regardless of the fact that we didn't have the word education in the title of our topics, education came out just like a, like a big word that is hitting all of us, that wherever we go, the education is going to be more and more crucially important. That's one of the conclusions of our panel when we were talking about economy as well. I'll come back to that. Uh, but before that, I want to thank very much, Madam uh, Chair, my dear President Vaira, and of course, my dear friend uh, Ismail, co-chair of the NGIC. You did a great job, and I think that you really uh, are moving us all together and making us to be more young in our spirits, in our moods, in our thinking, in our energy. Uh, and I really want to thank you for what you were, for your, what you were doing all these days. Uh, Mariano, of course, the same goes to you. I mean, it's very glad, I'm so glad that your foundation is working with us so close. And this is not something that is happening out of blue. It is happening with just once. We happen to be more and more like a family in different ways. Of course, Dr. Chow, uh, uh, your presence shows that our circle, our global circle is giving results and you brought in some kind of new flavor in our overall activities, and I want to thank you for that as well. Uh, of course, uh, Nolene, I mean, I, would, I think that the great thank goes to our uh, moderators of our panel, uh, to you, of course, to Helen that is not with us, uh, to, to Eka, and of course, to my dear friend Ismail, you have second thank already as a chair and as a moderator of the panel. And uh, last but not the least, I think that is important to underline, uh, this is one of the conclusions of our panel, what I'm saying now, that uh, Roshan did a great job. And uh, our secretariat really did a great job. And it's amazing how these young people, Roshan is much older than he looks uh, compared to some of us who are trying to pretend that we look younger. But Roshan is much younger than he looks. And he's really, I mean, someone who is heading our secretariat. And I think on the end of these four days, we should really uh, pay a big tribute to our secretariat and people who are leading, uh, who are making us be more functional in every aspect. Having said so, I think that the word leadership is something which, uh, uh, which is a common denominator of all panelists. That today what we're missing is lack of global leadership. But uh, there is also a suggestion we should go another way around. If global leadership is something that we expect from the top goes down, we need the leadership that will grow. They will go from a grassroots to go from, from, from below. And one of, the, one of the conclusions was that what we should think about, uh, that uh, there is more need than ever before to have some kind of leadership that is based on an alliance of likely-minded people, organizations, individuals. And NGIC and all of us that are working and putting together a lot of people, we look like some kind of a, a alliance of like-minded because uh, every voice counts and more time that is in front of us, bigger challenges that are in front of us, it, it looks to us that we need more a leadership of a lot of people who are putting together some kind of, a lot of elements together and creating one big gravity. Uh, next five or 10 months, according to what we thought, 
is going to determine strongly, not next year, but next five or 10 years at least. Uh, we can emerge from this crisis a better world. We all agree that this is crisis that has ever been before in our lifetime. When it comes to economy, this is the biggest, when you talk, think about GDP per capita output, I mean, this is the biggest crisis since 1870. In the last 150 years, uh, there is no bigger crisis in economic sense than, than this one. And when you look at that from that perspective, when you take a look how this crisis was uh, connected with epidemics, and this is not only economic crisis, but epidemics, it is generating more poverty, more poverty than ever. We heard the fact that International Labor Organization announced a month ago that if this continues on, out of 3.1 trillion jobs, more than half is jeopardized to be lost. And this is something that is going to create bigger poverty. It is going to create bigger than especially to emerging markets and to developing countries. That's the reason why we con concluded that besides the big picture and big, big, so to speak, big things, United States and China relations that are strongly defining our future, we have to think about the third world about emerging countries, about the European Union, about, especially it gives another impact to the Belt and Road Initiative as something that should be rejuvenated and let's say re-energized again, because Belt and Road Initiative is something that is strongly oriented to the shared future of developing countries as well as developed countries. So in that context, uh, our conclusions go to the uh, to, the, to the very precise point that we are now confronted with global challenges and global problems and global challenges and global problems when it comes to economic problems, educational problems, environmental problems, or epidemic problems, those are all global challenges and global problems. Those problems cannot be tackled and especially sorted out without global approach. And today, a lot of fight and a lot of a lot of countries are trying to solve those problems as a local problems we have to avoid that and that's why alliance of as we call it uh, like-minded people individuals and so on is very important that's what ngic is about uh, last point we are in search for new normal we should not forget that of course economy is not everything but without economy nothing is possible but at the same time Without economy that takes in consideration, not like before, economy that is taking in consideration respect to the limits of our environmental reality, which is clearly encapsulated in Agenda 2030, which is clearly defined by SDGs, we have to rejuvenate, we have to refocus, re-strength, re-energize SDGs and Agenda 2030 in its overall capacity because it was, it is, we are lucky that we have it. If we didn't have it, we would be much bigger problem when we enter the COVID crisis. So we have to go back to Agenda 2030. And uh, having in mind the changes we already see in response to COVID-19 proves that reset of our economic and social foundations is possible. So at one time, we have biggest problems than ever, bigger problem than ever, but at the same time, we are sorting it out. So three R's we are seeing as, a, as something that we should tackle uh, sustainable development, especially economy, that is taking consideration environment, which is resilience, first thing. Second thing is reboot and restart the things that should be rebooted, but don't think about getting back to the way it was. So that's the reason why third R is reimagine, recreate, rethink. And maybe smile, I'm sure that as a last Leonardo among us, you will like this, what I'm gonna say, is uh, if uh, Black Death was followed by Renaissance, Maybe, maybe we should think about new renaissance as a black death of 21st century that hit us as a, as a COVID-19. So we have to look for the new renaissance to rethink, to go back to our fundamental principles. And that's where the philosophy of Nizami Ganjavi and Nizami Ganjavi International Center that is putting us together is getting its strength. Dialogue, tolerance, learning, and understanding. That's the way forward to look for the new renaissance. And I'm sure that, Ismail, you are going to be the right person to give us some hints about how to make some kind of, some kind of analogy in between renaissance time and this time. 
when Constantinopolis fall, a lot of people moved to Italy and then with the libraries, with a lot of knowledge. So you never know when the crisis hit us, how it can uh, open the new gate, a new door for something that may be better. And last but not least, I just want to reiterate again, as I said, uh, education, education and education. Without education being built up in all the layers of discussions that we have, without education being education for shared mindset, shared mindset, shared knowledge, shared future, shared responsibility, shared development, uh, we are going to be lost in space because our, our choice is not in between one or another society. It's about in between shared or segregated societies, worlds, countries, and so on. And COVID is going to, maybe COVID gave us a warning, maybe nature or the mighty force or whoever called it, however, maybe we should use this as a warning, last warning, a clear shot that we have to make a new normal be better than the previous normal because previous normal was not normal. So let's go for something. That is one of the conclusions of our, our uh, panel. And I want to thank, uh, I'm sh I, maybe some of the panelists will look at it, but I'll send a personal note to all of my panelists. Panelists were great. I will not, I will not uh, make any distinction from the ones who were calling from Paris, from Athens, from Jerusalem, from Baku. I mean, it was really a great panel and I learned a lot as I always do with people like you are. And I learned a lot in looking and monitoring previous three panels as well. So thank you. And uh, we, we, will, we will prevail. Thank you, Zlatko. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, uh, we are greatly privileged to have somebody with us who can speak for a founding member uh, and the guiding force and the home country of the United Nations building, somebody to speak for the United States at a time when a former ambassador to the United States, uh, whose latest book, Our Ambassador to the UN, has sent over to me electronically, and which I've been lead reading with great dismay because uh, Ambassador Bolton seems to have contempt for the United Nations contempt for the European Union, contempt for his neighbor Canada, fear of China and its power, uh, uh, a willingness to and a happiness to disembowel and to, to destroy any international agreement and treaty that the United Nations uh, that uh, had created or that the United Nations uh, um, had proposed or that the United States had actually signed on an international plane. Uh, this is one view uh, of, uh, but, uh, of a high official. Uh, and I understand that the United States uh, at the moment has, as an election is coming up, has of course uh, various views uh, being expressed in the population. We are greatly privileged to have with us and very grateful to Dr. Susan Elliott, to Dr. Susan Elliott, Ambassador and President of the National Committee on American Foreign Policy from New York in the United States. And she has a subject of her own which is to talk about perspectives on how international organizations should respond or could respond to new challenges. Ambassador Elliot, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Madam President. It's an honor for me to be here with all of you to hear the readouts of the panel discussions. And I especially like what Zlatko said, because I certainly agree that we need to take this time as an opportunity to look at how we've done things, but to have a renaissance or a new normal in, in um, how we as countries uh, interact. And um, while, um, Madam President, you brought up 
you know, the new um, book that has been uh, written by our former uh, ambassador to the UN. What I'd like to do is focus on positive, um, because I think, especially in the US now, um, as many of you know, because you're not here, but you see what you hear in the press. And um, what I'd like you to hear is what the National Committee on American Fo Policy has been trying to do in a time when I think many governments, as we pointed out, uh, have not, and even international organizations, as we talk about the UN, have not been able to come to agreements on how to handle the pandemic, how we will move forward. And so what we've done in our, I'll call it our small way, is continued what we've done for many years. And Madam President, you know, of knowing our former, you know, my predecessor, um, Dr. George Schwab, that we do uh, track two discussions among people in conflict and uh, try to come to conclusions and try to find ways to move forward. And this has been especially important. During the pandemic, um, we had to think about how are we going to continue because we can't bring our colleagues, especially from Asia and from other countries uh, together in New York. So we have moved, just as we're having this dialogue today, we've moved all of our dialogues to the virtual space. And I think initially we were concerned that um, our colleagues who traditionally would come to New York and talk in a private setting would be less likely to speak um, on, a, on Zoom, just as we're doing right now. But we have, since uh, March, successfully conducted over 15 private um, discussions, and they are on US-China strategic dialogue. We have many uh, colleagues and friends in China. We also have a dialogue, a cross-strait dialogue, where we bring um, scholars and experts from China and from Taiwan together to discuss the issues among not just those two countries, but the US as well. We have been discussing North Korea, and we bring together uh, five uh, countries, again, scholars from China, from Russia, from the United States, from uh, South Korea and Japan to, again, discuss uh, issues. I think these have been very important, especially, I will say, at a time when there are tensions, especially between the United States and China, that we have been able to successfully um, talk to each other about points of view. And I think to explain to our, and you can read some of the reports we've, we've written, their Chatham House rules, but to explain to our Chinese colleagues what we think is going on in the US. And likewise, they explained us, because I think the resounding um, conclusion we've come to is that the relations not only between the US and China, but among countries of the world are extremely important. And that if our governments won't do uh, discussions in a track two level, we need to keep these lines of communication open uh, among um, our colleagues and experts and friends in countries around the world. We have an upcoming dialogue uh, where we will discuss U.S.-Russia issues. We have had dialogues where we are discussing uh, things in the Middle East. We also have public programs. So a silver lining for us is that the public programs that we normally would host in New York, which would have a small audience, um, have um, grown in size. So for example, we had a dialogue with the former National Security Advisor, um, before John Bolton, H.R. Um, McMaster, and we were able, instead of bringing him to New York and have about 100 people hear him, we were able to have a dialogue where we had over 300 people register for the discussion. So I just bring you some of the, um, the things that we've been doing. I feel, even though I've been working from my home since March 16th, I've been working harder I think, than I've ever worked in the past two years. Um, and in fact, uh, especially when I would much prefer my Chinese colleagues to come to New York, because then we could, we could talk to each other during business hours. But with the time difference, as you all experience today, you know, I, we either talk at, we switch. Sometimes we talk at 7 a.m. 
and sometimes they talk at 7 a.m. and vice versa or 8 o'clock in the evening. So I think that shows you the dedication at least we at the National Committee have for trying to keep lines of communication open. And um, how does that relate to, um, you know, your organization? And I do think that we, I've had a lot of contact with Rob Sean, and um, I don't know, I've seen him in person, and I think he looks pretty good, whether he's older or younger than we think he is. But uh, he really, he and I have had a lot of discussions, and I'm also involved with another organization called the Caspian Policy Center. Um, we would like to do more, and I hope I'd like to just propose this, if Rafshan doesn't mind, and Madam President, that we try to do more um, cooperation, you know, between our two organizations. As many of you know, we have hosted some of you in New York. I participated um, in the programs you've had in New York, and I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to to strengthen the relationship that we have in not only supporting, um, you know, the initiatives, and I've been very happy to sign on to many of the things, Madam President, that uh, Nizavi has um, proposed, and I've had the full support of my board of trustees to be able to sign on to these, um, to the letters that you have sent, and I hope that this will continue. And Ravshan and I have been talking even during this discussion about how we're going to um, meet next week and think about ways that we could further strengthen our relationship. So I leave you with that, and I want to thank you again for um, including me in this distinguished group of, of uh, former um, leaders of countries and scholars. And I look forward to many more discussions. And thank you, Madam President, for your leadership of the organization. So thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Those are very kind words. And uh, it, it's a pleasure to hear your readiness uh, for continuing collaboration between our organizations. Your predecessor, uh, Dr. Schwab, is a dear friend of mine. He's a, he's a fellow Latvian by birth, but a dedicated American. Uh, and I have been privileged to receive from him the documents published by your organization. Extraordinarily uh, interesting and, and to hear uh, about the activities uh, over the years, including regular trips to China, after all, for dialogue, uh, which I think have been extremely important. I look very much forward to continuing uh, a fruitful collaboration. Thank you so much for being with us. Our next speaker is an extraordinary woman who is uh, co-responsible for the organizing uh, of this conference uh, together with the Nizami Ganjavi International Center. My dear friend Mariana Bardenioyanis uh, is a co-founder uh, of many organizations or founder of them. She has her own foundation. She is an extraordinarily generous uh, kind uh, uh, and caring uh, philanthropist and humanist, uh, a special goodwill ambassador of UNESCO for many years, very dedicated to this task. Uh, she has a love of humanity and that uh, shines through everything that she does. Uh, a deep patriot of her country, we are grateful to Mariana for obtaining for this event the high patronage of Her Excellency, uh, the President of the Hellenic Republic, uh, or as the Greeks say, uh, the President of Democracy. Uh, it's a great honor for us. Uh, we were also to have uh, the honor of having with us uh, another goodwill ambassador of UNESCO, uh, the first Vice President of uh, Azerbaijan, uh, the, the host country uh, of our center uh, in Baku. Madame Mariana has a clear insight into the urgent needs that the world has and a care for the organizations that do their best to answer to them. Dear Mariana, your topic for today is the UN at 75. Thank you, my dearest friend, Vaira, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. 
Today you have reached the end of our conference, and I'm very pleased that during these three days, we listened to excellent speakers, came out richer in knowledge, and led the foundations for all of us to move forward together in our next uh, steps. Uh, it was a great honor for our foundation to call host this extraordinary gathering and to pay tribute to the 75th anniversary of the United Nations. Our web conference brought together eminent personalities from different countries, different cultures, different fields of expertise. However, everyone spoke in the same language, the language of the United Nations. All our speakers stressed the importance of global solidarity, of international cooperation, and of sharing responsibilities for the building of a better world, better future. May I recall Kofi Annan, who said that suffering anywhere concerns people everywhere. The pandemic of COVID-19 proved these words and made the causes of the United Nations more important than ever. Because no country can confront some global issue alone. And, and no coordinated action can be achieved without peace and understanding. We are all part of one humanity, and we must ensure that peace, diversity, equality, and, inclusive, uh, and inclusiveness will be the fundamental elements of our global human civilization in the decades to come. Elements that the United Nations and their great leaders who served as Secretary General of the organization were fighting for during those 75 years. Let me pay tribute to them. Trig uh, Valley, Doug Hammerseld, Uthant, Kurt Walterheim, Javier Perez de Cuellar, Butros Butros Legali, Kofi Annan, Ban Ki-moon, and today Antonio Guterres. Made the voice of the United Nations reach every corner of the earth and inspired us with their personal example, their will, and their strength. Ladies and gentlemen, His Excellency Ban Ki-moon used to count his teachers among the most influential people in, the, in his life. I, I also do so. And I strongly believe that the key for a better world is peace and human rights education, which lays in the heart of UNESCO's mandate. Because education shapes characters, changes mentality, and can make young generations feel that they are part of one human world, regardless of color, gender, religion, and beliefs. Our foundation will continue the efforts to contribute in this vision, and it will be a real honor to join forces with all of you. Once again, I would like to thank warmly Her Excellency, the President of the Hellenic Republic, Mrs. Katerina Sekelaropoulou, for the honor of having the conference under her patronage. I would also like to thank Her Excellency, Mrs. Mehrban Aliyeva, First Vice President of Azerbaijan. It was an honor for me to deliver her message at the opening upon her request. And also, Ms. Andrea Anastasiadis, First Lady of Cyprus, for her, her message, her valuable support and contribution. My warmest thanks to the Nizami Ganzabi International Center, the co-chairs, Dr. and dearest friend, Dr. Vaira Vaik Freiberga, and my dear friend, Dr. Ismail Zerzeldi for this important initiative that we co-organized. They are the driving forces of the NGIC and inspire us with their determinations and wisdom. I would like to thank all our speakers for the inspiring views and remarks, and especially for their commitment to the visions we share to safeguard the past and shape a better future for all. And last but not least, I would like to thank the Secretary General of NGIC, Mr. Ro Roswell Murado, for his great help, as well as all the staff of NGIC and the Fall Foundation, the invisible heroes of these efforts. As a recognition of their valuable contribution, our foundation would like to present a certificate of appreciation for the staff of NGIC for our excellent cooperation. 
Thank you, my dearest friend. Well done. I wish happy 75th anniversary to the United Nations Organization, organization hoping that it will continue to unite peoples, bridge cultures, and build a world of peace and solidarity. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mariana, for your wonderful and warm words, as ever, and inspiring. You have been inspiring in your actions and in your words and in your personal interactions. You are a treasure for all of us to have as a friend. Dear friends, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, the Nizami in Anjavi International Center is privileged in having established a new structure of support for it, which is called the Global Circle. And we are privileged to have as a co-chair of the NGIC Global Circle, Dr. Chow Chuck Wing, a philanthropist who is a visionary and also a humanist, a man with whom I've had the great privilege and a pleasure of working together for a number of years now in when I'm wearing my other hat, which I had for two terms, and that was uh, the president of the World Leadership uh, or, um, Alliance and, and uh, Club de Madrid, uh, who collaborated quite closely with Dr. Chao Chak Wing in bringing this international body to China. But we have had the extraordinary pleasure of having Dr. Chao Chak Wing declare now his interest in the Nizami Center and its interaction with China as well. He has been a general supporter of our body and its uh, principles uh, and, and guiding, uh, guiding uh, lines of action. And during the COVID conference, particularly, his personal support of our staff uh, in Baku and his ability to allow them to participate uh, in international efforts has been quite remarkable. I therefore give the floor now with great pleasure to my dear friend and in this context, my colleague, Dr. Chow Chak Wing, and uh, may we hear his message about uh, the support of NGIC in helping people in need of medical supplies for COVID, the 75th anniversary of UN, and of course, the NGIC role uh, as a help in the SDGs of the United Nations. Dr. Chow Chak Wing. Firstly, thank you, Madam President, for your introduction and kind words. I would also like to express my gratitude to the NGICs and the Mariana Variadanis Foundation for organizing this panel. It is great to be able to utilize this technology we now have and to be able to have this discussion with you all. Over the past few months, the effects of COVID-19 are continuing to be felt globally. The NGIC has importantly expressed solidarity and support to our international friends and partners. It is imperative for the wider community to continue protecting vulnerable populations, and it is essential that global solutions are found to secure a rapid recovery. This year marks the 75th anniversary of the founding of the United Nations, and I stand in firm belief that international cooperation, multilateralism, and maintenance of world peace and security are of vital importance. This 
迫使疫情的环境下，更加要出现它的重要性。This mission is as essential now as it has ever been, especially with regard to this year's challenging situation. 我们要推进联合国二零三零可持续发展议程。落实十七项可持续发展的目标，团结与合作比任何时候的更重要。As we move forward together, it is crucial that we maintain solidarity, cooperation, and unity. We must therefore strive to promote the implementation of the UN's 2030 agenda and 17 sustainable development goals. 我将与在座的各位，以及尼加米中心和全体会员和国际伙伴加强合作，促进世界和平发展，维护人类的健康安全，实现更加美好的未来和不懈的努力。I will continue to stand alongside NGIC. All our friends here over the past three days, as well as our international partners, in order to fulfil our collective responsibilities and ensure that we enhance our efforts to create a shared and better future. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, this brings to a close. Yes, yes, Ismail, uh, you wish to speak? Sorry, uh, let me just unmute. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm unmuted, I'm okay. Can you, you can hear me now, right? Yes, yes thank you. you wish to speak? Uh, yes, just before we, we bring this uh, to, the, to a close, I really uh, wanted uh, to uh, also join you in expressing uh, my personal thanks uh, uh, to everybody, but particularly, of course, Mariana, with whom uh, we've been working together for so many years on so many projects, and also uh, to hopefully my new friend, who I will have the privilege of knowing, uh, working with uh, Dr. Chow. Uh, and uh, I would like to pick up on what was said by Mariana, and specifically, I would like to express, uh, I think, Madam President, uh, uh, on our behalf, and maybe on behalf of all the participants, a special thank you uh, to our secretariat, uh, particularly uh, Ilaha, Tamira, and Asim, who have worked very, very hard on this particular event, and of course, our Secretary General. And uh, perhaps uh, uh, we will uh, issue a commemorative uh, 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 certificate as well as the one that Mariana was mentioning. And uh, I just wanted to make sure that we got this into the record. And I thank you for giving me this chance. Thank you, Mother. Thank you, Ismail. You have, uh, as usual, taken the words out of my mouth. Uh, and, and we do, uh, in fact, think remarkably alike. This is why we have been working together uh, so successfully for these last years. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to the end of an extraordinary gathering of minds talking about shared future and our shared responsibilities within it, uh, all this in honour of the 75th anniversary of the creation of this marvellous uh, dream, which is the United Nations, which I hope someday will be fully realised, not just symbolically, but in a literal sense that nations of the world will be able to be united in their goals and in their methods uh, for achieving them. Meanwhile, it is important to state, to reiterate and to debate about what these goals are and how they are to be put in practice, how they are to be realized. And uh, NGIC has been one of these agents of change one of these agents of convincing, persuading uh, both officials, various capacities, uh, and the general public 
about the wisdom of thinking of win-win situations as we see in a in the programs the belt and road program that the chinese president has uh, put in place a world where we do not think in zero-sum game uh, kinds of concepts but where win-win situations are the goal that we try to reach where not everybody will always have exactly the same opinion and exactly the same things but the idea of living together, working together, and uh, shaping and protecting our world together remains primordial. We are grateful, and I reiterate again, to Mariana for her invaluable support. The Mariana V. Vardinoyanis Foundation has made this uh, event possible together with the NGIC. Uh, she is a truly uh, a generous and, and, and beloved friend of ours and of all the ideas that she has expressed. We are grateful to Her Excellency, uh, the President of the Hellenic Republic. We are grateful to Her Excellency, the first Vice President of the Republic of Azerbaijan for the participation and the patronage of this event. And to all the distinguished speakers of various uh, and uh, varied experience in various walks of life over the years of great accomplishments that if we could put them all together i think uh, they would make mountains move um, uh, if we put all our strengths together and we try to do that uh, with our comings together uh, we have uh, the privilege of having since the foundation of the ngic uh, a young man of indeterminate age uh, by the name of Roshan Muradov, uh, who since the beginning has been uh, extraordinary in his commitment to the idea of bringing alive the heritage of Nizami and the ideas that he stood for. Uh, when we started out, he was there practically alone, single-handed, well, co-chairs sort of backing him up and, and, and a board of trustees, of course, a, an international board, by the way, of very distinguished personalities, to all of whom uh, Ismail and I are immensely grateful for their past and current contributions to the running of this organization. But at this moment, I would like to say what uh, uh, my, my uh, friend uh, Ismail has already said, is that Rovshan has a special status in all the activities that we organize. Uh, he really uh, goes well beyond the call of duty. All of you have been personally contacted by him in order to convince you to participate in this. And for this, Rovshan, we are immensely grateful to you. But also, please convey our thanks uh, to your wonderful young colleagues uh, these are young people who have been in many ways trained under your leadership. They have grown and developed uh, in interaction with the personalities that NGIC has been able to gather together, both in the Baku forums and in various other uh, parts of the world in our, in our international activities. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, these are hard times in some sense, uh, but in another sense, they're no harder than what uh, people over the centuries have had to in endure and in many parts of the world they still have to endure unendurable situations. So thank you for participating in the idea of international collaboration, in the idea of international law and order, in the idea of international rules and regulations that would guide the behaviors of sovereign nations, where sovereign nations need not give up their, solid, their, their sovereignty, but where in the spirit of solidarity they share part of their sovereignty to build a sovereignty for the entire world. Thank you very much for participating and we look forward to meeting again on another topic of the day. Goodbye to you all and thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Thank, thank you to everybody. Have thank you. Have a nice yeah. day and stay safe and healthy, all of you. Thank, thank you. you very much.